Okay, hi, my name is Ashley O'Brien, and today I'll be discussing my research from a paper I completed last semester titled D Disinforming the Internet. Uh, this research was completed in Dr. Nigel Harstad's Communication Research and Methods class during the fall semester of 2020. Individual research based on the same research questions of the overall class being research question one what factors increase someone's intention to share news story in social media? In research question two, what factors increase the likelihood that someone will share a false news story, misinformation, or disinformation on social media? Uh, the topic and uh, kind of some of the background, um, misinformation and disinformation are not new concepts at all. Um, we've termed fake news over the past few years, but this has been around forever. Um, social media users are facing new threats to information um, more than before um, by way of memes or Facebook groups that circulate these misinformation topics and ideas, um, also through targeted advertising. Um, so some of the solutions to fake news that we've seen in the past, since this is such an issue, um, is the social network site managing and monitoring. Um, so taking on that responsibility themselves, them hiring people to go through content every single day, thousands and thousands and thousands of tweets or posts or whatever, um, and taking that responsibility on themselves. Um, and then another solution has been through legislation. So government stepping in um, to uh, figure out new ways that um, we can monitor this information. Um, and then lastly, through some sort of external government organization uh, or organizations to ensure unbiased scrutinization. So just making sure that um, there is no overstep by the government. Um, I'm not promoting any of these three. These are just what I had read prior. I would say that the research I uh, completed actually focuses more on user engagement and user responsibility when it comes to misinformation and disinformation. Um, I don't think uh, the, you know, the effects of disinformation and misinformation will decrease um, if there's not a solution that specifically centers on the user's experience interacting on social network sites. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that um, effective monitoring can mature uh, if we don't actually understand the user itself. So some important concepts of this research, research um, real news uh, from a journalism perspective, uh, being that they have the uh, responsibility to report independent, reliable, ac accurate, and comprehensive information, um, and its nature of both being socially constructed and real world constructed. Um, and I would also argue that fake news is also kind of similar in that sense. Um, there is no specific definition for fake news as it's a new term and it's still evolving, um, but it mostly refers to viral posts based on fictitious accounts made to look like news reports. Um, and then another uh, good term that should be known is misinformation, which is the false, inaccurate, or misleading information that is communicated regardless of an intention to deceive. So this is typically done accidentally or without the user's knowledge. Um, and then there's disinformation, which is false information intended to mislead, especially propaganda issued by government organizations to rival power or the media. So the methods that I chose for this research is a snowball sample uh, through an anonymous Qualtrics survey via email distribution. Um, I asked Dr. Harstad to send it out and then I sent it to a few friends. Um, so this method was definitely out of convenience. Users would respond to questions about um, social media use and engagement through five point and seven point Likert type scales. Um, so, you know, on a scale of one to five, um, you know, how often do you check your sources? Questions like that. Um, the big, biggest concerns for this method is threats to validity and reliability. Um, I focused on undergraduate students between the ages of 18 and 24. So there's also a question as to how diverse these results are going to be and whether or not that is representative of entire population of social media users. So for the results, um, the distribution of this survey occurred during November and December of 2020 for approximately one month. We only received about 20 individuals uh, who responded to the survey, which is not great. Um, those reported being 11 females, six males, 
Um, majority of the participants reported having some college as their highest level of education, with the next highest being reported at being a four year degree of some sort. Um, only 17 of the 20 participants responded to these questions of gender identification and education status. Um, but I will say that every single person who took the survey completed the survey. So there was no, um, you know, survey fatigue, um, but there definitely uh, is a threat to validity and reliability. And the results that I'll be discussing in the next slides um, are most likely not statistically significant. Um, they Actually, they definitely aren't, but um, it could still lead us to learn more about the topic. So for the first test that we did um, was uh, whether or not it proved, uh, excuse me, there was a, not a statistically significant difference between the mean of women and the mean of men in regards to whether they pay attention to the news. Um, so we can interpret these results as women are more likely to admit they have shared fake news before compared to men. Um, but the test does hold about a 62% chance of producing erroneous results. Um, there's probably some sort of mistake or incorrect uh, result, um, probably because there is a lack of uh, amount of respondents and a lack of diversity in the respondents at hand. The second test we did was a Pearson's correlation examining the frequency of the respondents, um, Twitter use, and whether they check another source or Google to fact check the post before sharing them to social media. Um, so this had a negative inverse correlation with high Twitter use and um, a low amount of fact checking or Googling um, prior to sharing a source, um, which is interesting. It, it lends uh, a lot of information as to how people are interacting on social media. Third test we did was an ANOVA test of the question, I live in a filter bu bubble um, and education status options. Um, the results also show an increase in belief that they live in a filter bubble based on how much education they report. Those with a high school degree report they do not live in a filter bubble, whereas those with some college education reported they may or may not live in a filter bubble. Um, lastly, those with a four-year college degree reported slightly more than those with some college about whether they live in a filter bubble. So these results um, definitely uh, lend some insight as to increase in education versus increase in awareness on social media, um, probably some techn technology education and social media education, um, and whether or not uh, that person has been exposed to uh, theories of social media, theories of communication, the, you know, the stuff that we study. Um, while these results indicate that there is more data, data relevant to our research question too, but factors increase the likelihood that someone will share a false news story, misinformation, or disinformation on social media than our research question one, but factors increase someone's likelihood to share a news story on social media. Um, like I said, these results are not statistically significant, but I think they're very relevant to the field and the topic, um, which is more important in my opinion um, than not studying these questions at all. Um, and I think that a replication of the study would be super important and I'm sure that it will happen in the future. Thank you so much for listening.